So it's uh, 545. So that means that we're going to start right on time, right? This is the custom of the land, I understand. Everything runs like a German uh, train system on time. Uh, actually, I'm going to kind of hang out and talk and ask some questions, and then we're going to dive into it if some people come. So my name is Andy Kuharski. I'm going to say all this stuff again. I'm going to talk. This is a business talk. I'm going to try to slow down. Uh, so hand, uh, do we have some folks who are running businesses? Okay, so you guys are running businesses, and, and uh, where is everybody from? Texas. Texas. Whoa, Texas. That's Denmark. Denmark? <laughs> okay, is this, the, where are you from? Okay, so this is the, <laughs> okay, if anybody's not, is anybody from South America, you cannot sit on that side. <laughs> uh, welcome, welcome. I was just in Korea a uh, couple, who do you work for in Korea? Which company? Open, Open F, great. Uh, and you, where Brazil, U.S. You gotta go on that side, man. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. You're Peru, Peru, Colombia, California. Come on, you guys are getting it wrong. Brazil. Okay, we're gonna start in one minute. Okay, so, oh, I guess I don't, I may be being recorded right now. I am? Okay. So, my talk is going to be about measuring everything, and it's, um, it's a personal journey of many, many mistakes that we have made in my company, and so I'll share those with you, and it's an evolving journey, so I am here, of course, to learn from... Um, from you guys, and, and uh, hopefully I can share some things that, that will help you avoid make some of the mistakes that we've made. All right, so I am, uh, my name is Andrew Kuharski. I am uh, the founder and president of Chromat Source. Uh, those are my kids, and uh, I think they are making a snowman, wondering where their dad is, because I'm always on the road. So <clears throat> I, uh, I, I do travel, I do uh, Drupal stuff, and, and I run uh, Promet Source. I've been uh, uh, doing this, well, I've been in consulting and manager and running business for about 20, 20 years now. And I, I, as you can probably tell from the previous picture, I am from Chicago. And, and in Chicago, we are Promet Source. Uh, we are a Drupal development shop founded in 2003. We've been doing Drupal for about, uh, since 2008, so that's like seven years now. Um, we offer 24-7 support, and we focus on custom development, and this is important for the talk. So we do custom development. Uh, we also provide DevOps services, so we have a DevOps philosophy, so we have support services, uh, system administrators that work with developers and our support team and we provide support uh, to our clients, and that is a separate uh, service line. So uh, I like measuring things, and that's really why this was a fun talk for me. So uh, I was just in my hotel, and I realized that uh, I, uh, up to today, I took 4,878 steps. I use uh, Fitbit, and I'm happy to report that right now I am up to 6,767 steps. If I keep on walking, it's going to help me. So I, I, I like this stuff. I like statistics. I look at numbers, so I see how much uh, I sleep. And, I, I, and I, just because I look at it, I know how well rested I am and how much I, more sleep I need. Uh, not, not really. But I also like competing with some friends. So anybody, everybody has some Fitbit right now. I'm, I'm pretty good, doing pretty good right now. But you know, maybe if you have a Fitbit, friend me, and we'll uh, compete. Another measure, I have this scale at home. <clears throat> and in the last 2.8 years, I've measured, I've weighed myself 864 times. Luckily, as you see, this trend is going down. It's good. I, uh, I hit a milestone right after Christmas, the heaviest I've ever been. But it's trending down, right? That's important. So <clears throat> obviously, I like numbers and I like measurement. But why is that? What does that have to do with business? Well. Uh, 
I, I put something uh, uh, um, in, the, in, the, in the beginning of this talk about uh, numbers, which inspired, I think, the, the DA to accept this and vote for it. But um, you know, I think it's true. Uh, data is important. Uh, I like this saying, and, and God we trust all those bring data. Uh, and, uh, and, and the second one is really important. And, and I think that what gets measured gets attention and gets results. I, I truly believe that. So uh, some other, more words about metrics, right? So uh, besides the personal inspiration we get from these metrics that help us, motivate us to lose weight or walk more uh, in business, they, they, they tell us about what we're doing, right? So that could be used for marketing. Are we committing enough? Are we delivering on time? Do we have less bugs? You know, we have, what, 56 critical defects in Drupal? Well, Delt tells us something, right? We still don't have an end date, but it's less than 149, right? So that's good. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit of marketing. Uh, but it's good information to share with your share stakeholders that gives them a sense that, you know, it's not just your opinion, but you're backing your information by some fact. Okay, well, 56 critical tickets, that means that it's, go and it's going down. That's good. We're on the right path. Um, and it's a good way of communicate. But I think the most important part of it is, um, and I've noticed this around my teams and I think others, is that what gets measured gets re results and it gets attention from your team. So if you're running a business or a team and you're looking at measuring some instance that you want to improve, for example, your team will notice that you're doing it and you're doing it on a regular, ba regular basis and it will hopefully get the results that you're looking for by measuring them. So before we start looking at more numbers, um, I think your CEO from Tayer, Tayer, Tajer, Tayer, uh, they did a really nice job on the earlier presentation. I encourage you to see it online about setting vision and starting with why and, 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 and having a passion for what they're doing. And I think that measuring all things also starts with this thing. You start a business or you start a venture and you think about why, why are we doing this? Why, why is this important? And that drives to the mission and, and that starts, Dries talked about um, this at the Acquia Summit yesterday and talked about, well, at Acquia, we started writing down, what are we about? So he's got it down to five sentences, I think he said. And then from that, you get goals. And from goals, you get, okay, you break that down to objectives. What are we going to do next? What's next? And from that, you get, custom, uh, you get KPIs, right? So what are key performance indicators? And then you break that down further into metrics. So that's the kind of exercise that, that we like to go through that I think is important. So for example, my management team, on a weekly basis, we have a set of numbers. And it's not too many, it's just few numbers. And we thought about it really hard at the beginning of the year. What do we want to report on? And those numbers, they may, not, they may be responsible for the developers or the other teams that generate those, but it helps us drive the business. And it starts with the top. So what do I get evaluated on? I'm a CEO of a small company. We're about 30, 40 people, depending on how you measure, maybe up to 50. My primary way that I eva get evaluated is financial performance of the company. So that is revenue and net profit. Okay, well, what about, what about all these other things? That, you know, what about giving back to the community? What about client satisfaction, which is really important? Uh, what about your retention? Are your folks happy? I believe that it's my job to make sure that we have good financial performance so that we can achieve all these other things. And, and anybody else doesn't have to worry about those things. Once we have that footing, we can do things to increase client satisfaction. We can do things. We have the time for developers to go to camps. We can do all of those things. So my primary job is very simple, right? I get measured in hard numbers. Did we hit our profit objective? Did we hit our revenue objective? Yes or no? Right. Luckily, I can't get fired. Maybe not yet, but so it makes it a little bit easier. But it's but it's key, right? There is also a concept of a balanced scorecard. So that's a concept of measuring all a lot of other things besides that one number, and that is also important. And we look back on it, and we take a look at it from an annual performance basis. So we look at those hard few hard numbers for our team, 
question for myself, and then we take a look at a balanced scorecard. Okay, well, now that you've hit this number, or, or maybe now that you're having a problem hitting this number, let's take a look at these other activities and other parts of what we're doing to see whether we're hitting that. So we look at financial perspective, and we look at financial perspective for all of our uh, key members. We look at uh, customer perspective. So this is very, very important to us. And the second part of my presentation is really mostly about customer perspective, internal perspective. So are we, are we creating people that are growing themselves? Are they enjoying what they're doing? Are we doing good things? Are we, gro are we, are we growing professionally? That's one of my goals as well, right? So I get measured on financial performance, my personal goal is to grow as a CEO and become a better leader. So those other things are important, but they're not as clean cut as did you hit your number. <laughs> so just a little bit of balanced perspective here. Oh, Karen, I didn't know you were going to be here. <laughs> so <laughs> this is Karen. Uh, just a question, how am I doing in terms of uh, – not this side. The am I doing good in terms of sp speaking too fast or good? You guys are okay. Perfect. Uh oh. Okay, so I'll let you know. Yeah, I can. I I walk around. I'm, I'm pretty good with that. Uh, all right. So uh, further. So this is Karen. She's one of our project managers. She just so happens to be sitting right here. <laughs> last time, <laughs> last time I gave this talk, uh, she was not. She was another continent. So sorry, Karen. Um, so Karen's, Karen has some uh, measurable objectives in terms of what we're looking for, and that is project profitability, right? So we share project profitability with all of our project managers. So we have certain goals. At the end of the year, we review where we're hitting, whether we're hitting those goals. Uh, client satisfaction. So there is the financial, financial objective, and there's client satisfaction. And we would almost put that, I, would, I should have put that one as number one. Our net promoter score, I'm going to explain what that is, is number one. Are our clients happy? Team growth, uh, revenue contribution. So is Karen managing big projects, small projects? How are they doing? Um, and is she supporting us in terms of marketing? And by the way, so here's a plug. Karen has a session tomorrow on Women in Technology. Really highly recommended. Right? So we try to measure these things in real time, and we have real numbers associated with that. Uh, so Cobbs is uh, one of our solutions architects. He's a senior, senior development on the way to, to SA. And so what do our SAs get measured on? Estimation of projects. Are those projects accurately estimated, right? We do a lot of uh, fixed bid or RFP responses. So, But even during sprints, right, are you able to achieve the things that you're planning during an agile process? Those are important for us. So are, we, are, we, are those estimates realistic and are they being hit? Uh, correct architectural solutions. That's a KPI. So how do we measure that? Well, we measure that by defect counts. We take a look at uh, QA duration, QA process, are those things bouncing around a lot? Um, and then we have a number of uh, quality of code delivered. We are looking at number of defects and warranty period. We take a look at the feedback that our developers are, are providing. We have a, um, it's a, um, before you commit, you have to get reviewed, right, Dougie? So we take a look at all these things and try to get numbers around that. So again, Doug, you weren't Dougie. Another developer didn't expect you to be here, but just using it as an example, don't take it personally. Uh, <laughs> so, what do your developers uh, get estimate? Yes. What are, key measures? what are your key measures? So, I'm going to ask I have for the internet audience that's going to happen afterwards. I'm going to pass my mic. Like, what do your developers get? What are the measures that you use to evaluate developers? Okay, so. Uh, right now, um, we we are using the um, how can I say this in English? Let me check. It's like we are y measuring our performance through the pipeline of our process, agile process. So we we are trying to m uh, measure quality uh, against uh, 
um, bugs in the code uh, that is delivered. Uh, we also measure the estimation like you guys and also um, the, the, the time of we have to get um, uh, the result of the value we are delivering. So uh, it's it's com it's something like um, uh, if if we understand our ex uh, the expectation ex expectations of the our clients. So I think it's it's like uh, a really uh, major uh, in an indicator of uh, the quality we are trying to deliver. You know. That's great. I, I'm trying to some Q and A. I'm really actually really curious. I'm now. Um, how you achieve those, you know, key measures, right? Because that's sometimes hard to measure. <laughs> how do we measure? Well, that's a lot of things we measure. It depends on if the company, the maturity level the company give for the project. So if, because we work uh, with CMMI, maturity levels. So I've worked in projects of five maturity level and three, and it carries a lot of, of weight with that maturity level. So we do um, code reviews depending. Uh, it's almost like a standard already. So um, we, we agree with the client uh, the number of bugs that we go with releases uh so so for the for us is like first internal uh, standards and then uh, agreements with the client yeah cmmi is a really interesting model it's been around for years and years it's really cool anybody else here to so it seems like we're pretty aligned with what we're looking at and the one thing um that we also keep track, like administratively, that's an administrative part of us, is are we submitting the things that our developers hate to do? Timesheets. Keep track of whether those are complete on a weekly basis from everybody, entire company. So we also do support, right? So we measure a lot of things around support. Some of this stuff that you see on, the, on this slide and the next one is borrowed from a call center. We take a look at we have SLA, so service level agreements with our clients around SLAs. So we talk about whether we're hitting those. So uh, response, right? So in, in a call, typical call center, when you submit a ticket, you're measured against whether you hit that response. You know, you have like a call, a massive call center, so abandon rate. People, whether they they get through the, qu the issue. So the same thing here. Do people actually stick with asking that question, the issue? How long does it? Do they wait until they get they get to somebody, whether they can submit it? Um, so another call center thing is average speed to answer. We also take a look at do we answer that that re, do we an, do we respond to the particular problem, and response time. And again, another callback. Uh, those are those are really call center issues, but they do apply to a support, to the way we, we do support. Of course, resolution, right? So just because we have an SLA that says within the, this critical of an issue, you have to answer with this many hours. Uh, there's also a resolution, right? That's even more important. Just, I mean, it's nice to have somebody say, yeah, I got it, I know your problem, but it's nicer to say, okay, I understand your problem and here's your solution, right? So we take a look at that, uh, whether we are getting, uh, whether we are getting those, those issues closed within the, the time we promise our clients. And then, of course, it's really important to see whether we have tickets that are reopened. And that also, uh, you know, gets tracked to the, person who's uh, closing those tickets and, um, and, and the people managing those. Oops. So there's lots and lots of other support metrics that we, t we, we want to provide high cl client satisfaction around support. That's a really big part of our business. So we take a look at things like planned or unplanned time. We, took it, we take a look at uh, you know whether we so we took with we we trend that over time we try to see different differences so we know on a and this is what was very interesting this uh, topic of queue wait queue and, and 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 how much time is uh, or how how busy your team is so uh, can we answer do we do we know we try to predict how many how much unplanned work we're going to get on a weekly basis 
and then go back to uh, some of this. We don't always, we don't keep track of all of these things, but just to give you an idea of all the different measures that can be taken in a call center. So of course in project planning, we use JIRA, so we're starting to employ more and more type of uh, measurements in terms of our projects. So, uh, you know, and, and we do both uh, agile and, uh, and, and um, fixed bid. So we take a look at burn down rate, whether we have uh, our budget being used versus the number of features that are being completed. We take a look at open bugs. So all of these things, and we just recently adopted JIRA, so it's making it pretty easy for us to do. We take a look at, you know, we're in sprints, are we ahead of budget, under budget? Uh, and again, uh, going back to time reporting, it's pretty key. Actually, it's, it's not only important to measure those on a micro scale, on a, on a sprint or an issue or an estimation, but then to, to kind of pull up and take a look at it. I don't know if you guys uh, uh, had uh, this, uh, this experience before. We came to a project uh, where somebody just wanted, a, a client of ours just wanted a little bit of help. And this is a large project they've been working on for over a year. And we said, sure, we'll take a look at it. And um, we took a look at it, and we sent one of our project managers to kind of do a deep dive. And they used JIRA. And they, and they said, yeah, we just need a little bit of help because we want to finish it in a month. And we said, all right, let's take a look at this. So we looked at all their tickets, and we said, all right, so are these estimates correct? Yes. All you know, these 100 or 1,000 issues there, whatever number of issues there are outstanding, all these estimates are correct. And we said, well, that's interesting. Be are, you are you increasing your team? No, 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 we just want a little bit of help. So we said, all right, and you're communicating that you're going to get done in a month to your stakeholders. Yes, we are. Well, if you're not increasing your team and your estimates are correct, that means that you have six months that you can complete those <laughs> estimates with your current team. And it was like, whoa, their stakeholders totally blindsided by this, right? So it's good to roll that stuff up, not just look at it at a micro level. Um, yes, you have a question. Are you using um, Jira with sprints uh, for service desk, uh, for support teams? So that's a very good question. Uh, it is a little bit outside of what I'm talking about here, but we, yes, we are using Jira service desk, and we are, we are actually, we just transitioned there, so I don't have a full result, set of results there. Yeah, so this is a, this is a great discussion uh, because there's a lot of measurement around support. So for example, there is a, a, Jira has a service desk. Jira is a tool, if you guys haven't heard of it, it's a, it's a, it's a great tool, it's really by Atlassian, and it has uh, a lot of plugins, including Gitbucket and, and all those other things. And, We've adopted it recently. One of the nice premises around it is that it keeps track of the SLA. So if you establish SLA, service level agreements, with your clients, you can say, okay, a high level priority issue, I'm gonna address it in, X, let's say, five hours or 10 hours, wh whatever, you, you know, whatever you agree to do, whatever your capacity is. And then you can see how, <laughs> how quickly you need to add on, <laughs> react to that issue before, before it crosses the SLA, right? So the question is, how do we use it? And so I, I can have that conversation with you a little bit later. Actually, my, pro, my support uh, uh, director is running this, and I'm not that familiar with it, but I can tell you what I know afterwards. So in terms of project reporting, of course, we take a look at the big projects. We analyze issues, how many are high, uh, uh, medium, low. And this is, a, this is a, one of those metrics that's really uh, key in making that happen. And that you can report back, back to your stakeholders what a likelihood is something is going to succeed or not. So these are all great, and we implement them in our daily lives. And, and then we also do a lot of uh, retrospectives so we can learn from those things, how much time we spend on projects, how much, you know, what do we, where do we spend our projects. So we look at like this, this, this. We did this a while ago. But, you know, this is a pretty high, highly uh, focused development project. We actually developed for like 57%. The rest of it, it was spent in other activities, right? And this was like a development project. So retrospectives are important for, for um, uh, future ability to estimate and, and lessons learned and, and be able to, to do a better job on future projects. Also take a look at for capacity planning, looking at how much burn down you have per developer. This is another small uh, project. As you can see, this is pretty old. <laughs> but um, 
retrospective estimation. So, so keeping time of keeping track of time and what your time is, is spent on is important for us. So we were doing all of these things, and we felt like there's something that's still missing, an important part that um, we wanted to capture. And this was around, you know, uh, quality is really hard to measure, and client satisfaction, we thought, was pretty hard to measure. So um, we thought about this, and we started doing some research, and we really, really um, found some great things. And I'm going to talk to you about this for the rest of this, this session and why we made this a key part of what we do on an everyday basis. So we made a decision late last year to make focus on less focus on um, key numbers, but less numbers, and make the company goal to focus on one number. So we started doing some more research around client satisfaction and how we can measure that and how we can do better. And some really interesting things uh, came up when I was looking at this. So I just want to share those with you in terms of, for, for those of you who are running your businesses and companies, right? So um, I always... Why, why, while I didn't love it because customer complaints usually come at a time like right before I'm giving a presentation at DrupalCon or right when I've traveled for 20 hours and I just want to hit the pillow, but I need to hit that. But, th but those are really valuable. So I did not not like them, right? Why? So just like a bug, I was at a MySQL conference many, 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 many years ago, and the keynote said the most valuable thing all the developers can give me is a reproducible bug, right? A client complaint has, by, by, by some pretty decent research here, many other clients would never bother to say that. So if a client raises their hand and says, hey, I have a problem with X, Y, and Z, especially if it's tied to a process, we try to stop everything. As you guys, we stop the line and try to figure out what that is. Because behind that, there's many silent voices, and then that, need, that means that we need to address it immediately. Another interesting thing, 2% uh, in, in increase in customer retention is the same as decreasing costs by, by 10%. And I, I want to talk a little bit more about that. But that's great, right? So if you're running a business or you're running a team or you're responsible for P&L, making your clients happier is basically like cutting costs. So uh, how many of you guys had problems flying here or had some issues? Yeah, right. You talk to, did you tell people about that? Yeah, hell yeah, right? Like everybody, I, I complain about travel all the time. Talk to Dries, he's like, oh, this airport. You know, what I, so unhappy clients will tell many, 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 many more people about a bad experience. But happy clients may not. So another goal that we have is not to just make happy clients. Make really happy clients. Make, help them, make them feel like they need to tell your story. Uh, the other thing that we uh, also start, are starting to focus on is that, and this, this can be like a tough thing in engineering, right? Because we deliver a project on time, we deliver it on budget, and we deliver everything the client uh, asked for, and they're still not happy. What? Well, <laughs> there is an emotional uh, part of interacting with another human being that needs to be satisfied as well. And... Uh, for us, uh, a lot of the feedback that we received was really important. It didn't really have to do around the, the areas of improvement. Not many of them had to do around code quality. It was perceived very high. The value is perceived high. It's really about that emotional. It's it's about that emotional connection. And uh, so it, it may be difficult for engineering and and a, and a software team that's kind of, you know, and especially me who loves numbers, you know, how do you make that emotional connection? So uh, it's, it's key, but it really does matter. And, oh, and by the way, notice this one, right? So you can charge more if you provide better service. Like, they will not walk away if you charge more. They'll be happier because they want better quality service. And, and I don't know how much money or time you guys spend on marketing, but it, it, it costs, and I don't, we haven't done this. Hmm, we should do this, but uh, I wonder if it's six or seven times. It's, it costs a lot of time and money to acquire a new customer. If you really break it down, right, the amount of marketing, blog writing, your website, 
we have a marketing person. Basically, all they're in charge of is acquiring new customers, right? So how many new customers do you get divided by the salary? Then how much time do you spend on the phone, neg negotiating a contract? All of those things, a lot of money. Keeping that customer, just got to do a good job, right? So it really does make a lot of sense. The last thing, another fun fact I found during my, my research is that, uh, and uh, I think Seth Godin wrote this uh, cool book and that says all marketers are liars. Well, they're not liars. They should be telling a good story. But people tend to believe people they know. This is the, the blue line here is, is the percent that folks trust completely. The number one here is recommendations from the people that you know, right? So if you tell me that Lufthansa or Austrian Air or whatever it is that you flew here is terrible, I'll probably avoid it. Right, but if I read it that they're great on a on a, uh, on a on a flyer, I'll probably not believe it as much as I believe you. But I don't know you. So anyway, word of mouth, right? Your customers keep them happy. They'll they'll give you more business. So I hope I've convinced you that this is really important. So as a business, we really made a decision to to focus on this. But this talk is about measurement, not client satisfaction. So how do you measure client satisfaction? What are we doing to do that? So uh, who's here heard of, net prom of NPS, Net Promoter Score? So from me, I told you I weigh, I weigh myself five times a day. You know, I measure my sleep, wit, walk, whatever. I like to have a number around that. So somebody found a way to basically measure client satisfaction. And this is, uh, so this is Frederick Reicheld, I think that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, and he wrote this up in the Harvard Business Review like t more than 10 years ago. He basically did research on surveys and which surveys are most effective. And he found that uh, one company in particular was doing a one-question survey, and they were, um, and they were more, and using that survey to apply their practices, they were more successful than these other companies who, you know, how many times do you get a survey that goes on for pages and pages and pages, right? Like, first of all, you never complete those. And second of all, you just kind of, where, where, how do you do the analysis on it? I'm just going to do a time check. Okay. So he found that asking this one question uh, provided that so much value to this company that they were ahead of their competitors. So he then took this question at the time and applied it to companies who were growing and companies who are staying steady, and companies that were losing market share. And based on this one question of their clients, he asked for permission, he noticed that the companies who have a higher score in this one question were in a growth category, right? So um, clients who are getting high, ant high points for that one question were also growing. Uh, so, the, so there's a correlation between be having great customer service and, uh, and through answering this question and business growth. So that's basically an NPS. So the question is, how likely is it that you would recommend our company, a product, or service to a friend or a colleague? That's essentially that question. And the answer, and then you, you include one more text box for some input. And the way, so, but that has to tie to a number, right? So we take a look at the number of, the people who answer a nine or a 10, that means they're extremely happy. Not just like an eight or a seven, meh. How, would you, how, is it, how likely are you to recommend somebody else to see this talk on a scale of one to 10? An eight, nah, right? A nine or a 10, that means I did a great job. Uh, five or six, like you're just being kind to me. It sucks basically, right? You're a detractor. That's basically what it means. So what, what it does is the net promoter score basically throws out the seven and eight. The seven and eights don't count. It takes the nines and the tens and, sub, sub, and, and subtracts all the people who gave you a zero through a six, and it gives you a net promoter score. So that one score, it's actually a really widely adopted measure. There are many companies now that are building business, businesses, uh, online businesses that help you measure this stuff. And it gives you an idea of how well you do from a customer, from a customer client satisfaction perspective. So uh, basically, we started adopting this. and we really started thinking about a philosophy of, yes, we measure a lot of things in terms of building our projects. We're developers, we're project managers. We provide value, we try to partner up with our clients. We have to provide value to our, to our employees. 
But in the end, we wanted to have a number around how, how satisfied are our clients. And it was, it, we gave this, I gave a similar talk to an all, all hands uh, team meeting. And very quickly, everybody kind of saw the value of this. And we started talking about how, how happy are our clients? How are they responding? And we're tying the NPS, I don't know if you guys remember back, uh, the net promoter score is tied to our project manager's perspective, our, our evaluation. So uh, uh, most of the field folks have an NPS score. Of course, I have an NPS score as the entire company reflects uh, our, our ability to deliver client satisfaction, but it drives down to everyone who interacts with our clients. And we're looking at taking this, you know, we can't pull, we can't over pull our clients, but we're looking at having interactive measures and a reset. And we're looking to obviously continually improve on that number. We want to generate more promoters. We want to generate uh, fans who are going to tell other potential clients or other potential employees or, or, or other folks how great we do. And that's started to become part of our culture. What's our NPS? What are we doing to provide better customer satisfaction? So we started looking. Yes, question. I'm not a manager or anything. I'm a developer. But my question is simply uh, this statistic that you take, it seems like something that you can only ask once to a client. Um, or is it something you can repeat every year? How do you do that? How do you manage existing clients? If your client base is small, but you have a lot of existing projects and continual projects, how do you measure this if it's something that seems like you can only ask once? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So there is a small industry around uh, best practices for net promoter score polling. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, first of all, you know, statistically speaking, your sample size has to be really big to get uh, a true, true NPS. We don't have that luxury. Uh, you know, we have 50 or so projects, let's say, going on, or 100 projects going on every time, and then you multiply that by the number of people that we interact with. You don't get that great of a statistical number. Um, and the other question, a very, very good question, is how often do you poll? So we're looking at resetting that. You're, you, the, according to best practices for NPS, you're not supposed to poll more than six times so every six months. So like, if you keep on polling your, your clients, they'll just yeah, get tired of it. It's like, yes, you still suck, or yes, you're still amazing. Thank you very much, right? Or I don't care. Um, <clears throat> so every six months, the other thing that we're doing, uh, so because we tie this, we tie this number to um, to our um, team members' evaluations, right? So if Karen gets a really high high number, we're going to try to tap into that system, that secret, and see what she's doing better than some of the other folks that may not have that have that high uh, NPS. So we have a concept of of uh, um, continual polling. So as we bring new projects on, or if we have new folks that are coming on board, or if we have new experiences, we incrementally poll. Now we understand that's not that 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 could. Again, the statistical vari variance is, it, it doesn't give us that much, but it's better than, better than nothing. So we started looking at um, understanding better on how, you know, how we can deliver on that, on that quality, on, that, on, on, a, on, on a high score. So uh, we take a look at uh, you know, four areas of our service, and that is um, what is that perfect service? Right, we've been told perfection, nobody's perfect, things break, you know, we have redundancy, nothing's really, nothing's really um, perfect. So we're trying to basically, we, we understand that, yet we try to provide a service that is reasonable within, uh, within a, a foreseeable uh, framework of instances. So we try to set better expectations during the sales process. We have a, a, a re-onboarding re during the onboarding with the project manager introduction if you have a new project. And then we do certain toll gates during, or we try to do certain toll gates during projects to see whether we're still um, delivering. So delivering in a caring, friendly manner. So maybe as engineers, we... Um, We may not be so great at this always, and I guess I'm speaking to my former self as a former developer many, many, many years ago. Um, but first of all, there's another, um, there's an emotional intelligence and business uh, course on uh, Coursera that's really, really good. 
it basically talks about your attitude and how you interact with people. And people can really tell, basically the, the, the biggest takeaway from this course that I took is that people can really tell when you're bullshitting them. You know, when you're like not really happy to deal with that client, they know that you don't like them, right? They, they really do know. And, and um, one of the things that's interesting about me is I, I really like love my clients. I love all of our clients. I'm humbled by the fact they choose to spend thousands of thousands of dollars and time and bet on the, the fact that we're gonna get them a promotion, get them what they want, help them achieve their business goals, whatever it, whatever it is. So we talk about partnering up with our clients and seeing what they're trying to achieve and hopefully also buying into that, like really getting in what their needs are, whether, whether in fact they're totally disorganized, and maybe, maybe, maybe uh, <clears throat> well, all of our clients are super organized, perfect, perfect communication, always show up on time, they know what they want, always, right? So we're just here to help them get this, but in a, in a really caring matter. And so we, we say that we want to partner up with our, uh, with our we want to, we want to become partners with our clients. We really do. And we, it's really important that we also emotionally get involved and, and, and care about that. And, and if we show that, that, that's really a big part of the win. So in a timely fashion, um, this is also another interesting thing, right? In a timely fashion may not necessarily mean what it, to a client what it means to you. So obviously there are some expectations to be setting, right? There are, there are no projects that can be completed tomorrow. So you have to set those expectations, but you also have to take a look at, at what we're doing and how we're doing it and see whether that's timely. So that's another key, key uh, part, and, and backed by an effective problem resolution. So are we empowering our teams to, uh, to enable them to solve that problem? If something happens, do we have a communications process and, and a process where we can mobilize and solve that problem? So you know, we said there's no, there, you know, the, the perfect service is within normal operating uh, circumstances. When, that hap when something bad happens, how do you react? And from our experience, some of our best clients that are most, th that have great retention, and we always wanna make our client lifers, we call them lifers, we, wanna, we want them to be with us forever and ever. We had major problems. We <laughs> I can't even tell you how many screw ups we had like major, major issues. And we basically stopped what we're doing and said, yeah, we totally screwed up. And here's what we're gonna do to fix it. And we mobilize and we get things done, whether we delete files, whether we you know, lose a backup, wh whatever it may be, and we, fo and we communicate and fix it. And I see that a, an effective problem resolution, problem, uh, problem resolution process is in, in, in place and they can trust us not to abandon them and we own the problem and they've been great. So we try to deliver value. Uh, we take a look at the timelines and, and what we're trying to do, uh, what the client's trying to achieve, not just what they're telling us. Um, we try to break down different types of project by teams and different types of project by project managers so that we can deliver to what the client's actually expecting. Uh, establishing a relationship is really important, not which is the project managers, but the technical level. We establish a relationship between those folks from account managers and myself. I try to have a relationship with most of our stakeholders. Um, we do focus on automation and testing, continuous in, uh, deployment. Um, that helps us in terms of setting expectations and, and it decreases the time in uh, the deployment. Uh, so in terms of that timeline, we try to destroy silos. So have our system engineering team work with our developers, um, be able to quickly uh, respond uh, empower teams, so whether it's um, uh, uh, giving credit or whether it's uh, spending more time, uh, our teams are empowered to make those connections with their clients and, 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 and get that client satisfaction higher. Uh, culture, so this is, this is tough, right? Because Drupal developers are really hard to find. And some Drupal developers think that, or some developers, some folks, some people just think that they're always right. And, and, and if they can't embrace that culture that says, no, we're really here for the client because that's, that's really what drives our business and what we're trying important, I think it's better to say goodbye. If they don't have a, a good culture fit, it, it may hurt you in the long run to have that, that person than not. Um, and I borrowed this from Scott Messe. He's, a, he's at Pantheon. Um, he's a, uh, so he runs their support department. Uh, we also try to do this. So 
uh, we always say that uh, a project risk, there's a pro greater project risk that we don't have clarity. So complexity is not the, ri is not the risk. It's a lack of clarity, uh, whether we're accurately responding to whatever it is that we're trying to do, uh, executing correctly, and of course having empathy for the client. So those are some of the things that we're doing. We measure a lot of different things uh, throughout our different types of project and support and our personnel and time and where time goes. But ultimately, one of the things that we're focusing and it's, and it's starting to work really well is that client satisfaction or a net promoter score. So having that mindset, are we doing things that are going to increase that? And we have a, we have a cheesy theme this, um, <clears throat> this year, and that is put yourself in your client's shoes. So shoes is our theme. Uh, first part of the year, you know, what you know, what is your, what is our, what are our clients thinking? Because we're going to ask them to see how well, how much, how likely it is they're going to re recommend us. So that concludes my talk on um, measurement. Uh, I hope that was enlightening and, and helpful. I have already posted these slides on SlideShare, so I think that that's my Twitter. I'm going, that's my Twitter handle. I'm going to uh, tweet that as soon as we're we're done. And um, I wanted to open up the floor to questions. I'd love to hear how you guys are doing. And, and somebody give me a time check, by the way. I, I'm sure I have I had 45 minutes, I understand. So I have uh, 45 minutes talking in a 15-minute question Q&A, right? I'm actually, so in terms of time, I would give my, I'm just two minutes over. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> OK, so Q&A. And I, I think we can go, have they been letting? Okay, so we have like 15 minutes for Q&A. Okay, I have a question. This is regarding some figures that you presented, but I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> uh, I noticed that, for instance, you presented uh, uh, that you measure the time that, I mean, the, the meeting time that you have, for instance. Uh, so uh, also I noticed that uh, you show that you work under sprints. So I am assuming that you work under uh, an Scrum Agile, uh, sorry, an Agile uh, approach. So how do you tie those kind of uh, metrics uh, if you are working uh, under an agile approach? I mean, it seems to me that it's pretty tough, you know? I, I don't know if I'm explaining myself. Yeah, I totally understand. So the, so we have basically three types of projects, right? And, and, and um, it's pretty, it's important for us to recognize that they're different. <laughs> and so we have uh, support. And, and that's a completely different department, just around support. And we do measure time there, because we have a different. We don't have an all-you-can-eat type model, or, or basically a gym membership model, where you said sell 2,000 memberships, especially after Christmas and New Year's, right? Like everybody's like, yeah, I'm gonna go to the gym in January. Well, they sell 2,000 memberships, and it only holds 200 people. So if everybody showed up, they would be screwed. We, so we don't do all-you-can-eat. We actually me we set time aside, and we we measure and we charge our clients for everything because we provide value. Believe we provide value in every meeting. So we, we keep track of time there. Just so, and then yes, on development project, which is a different department, Agile is a little bit different. Uh, we take a look at it, or we try to check once in a while and make sure those projects don't exceed kind of what, is, what we expect. But when the first time we did, when we first time looked at a, a, a fixed bid project and we took a look at the time of the meetings, it was like, wow, that, that was huge. And we try to tell our clients, like, you know, come prepared, come, t come on time. Let's try to make this efficient because it is costing you. So if you show that to a client in Agile or, you know, we have a problem, for example, and we say, look, this is how much time you're spending in times and this is costing you, it's like, okay, we have some clients that just, like, really only want to have 15-minute meetings with us. We're like, great. Did that answer your question? Talking about the measurement and about um, the amount of project management, for example, you need or an amount of meetings you need, do you show these numbers to the client only afterwards, after the project, or do you have like checks in between where you say, okay, we are not on track on budget, and this is why? So Karen can tell, tell you about this for hours and hours and hours. Um, she had an interesting client project just recently. Um, we, depends. Um, so first of all, our philosophy is be completely transparent, so all of our clients have full access to our time tracking in JIRA. Every one of our team members is required to put in their time at the end of the day. We have a call out when it's not done at the end of the week, so they get like called out and said, hey, everybody else did it but you. Um, 
and uh, yeah, if the client, if like we share, they they have visibility into that. Uh, I don't have I don't have metrics on how many clients actually do look at that. I like I said, you know, before when we pointed it out to this one client, or like when we have um, overages on support, uh, and they want to get a detailed list, like everything is in there. And it has to be communicated internally, also, right? Because we share comments, and so I want to make sure that those cl comments are respectful, and you know, so. Did I answer your question? Partly. So, so when we have showed it to, um, so our clients are aware of that. I mean, obviously, you're working in this business. You understand that this, you know, this time is there. We don't make. We haven't made it a practice of saying this is how much time you're spending in meetings. Like we don't break it down in those areas. But maybe we'll try it. Sure. Anybody else? You had some questions before? Uh, in your opinion, what is the importance to have an, uh, one account manager and technical account manager? Because in my company, we just have account manager, and sometimes we have problems because we don't have technical account manager to serve this customer in this time, right? Yeah, that's a really good question, right? So we have to take a look at it in, in context, in terms of context for what kind of project it is and the size of the overall client. So for example, um, there are clients that I have a like a monthly check-in with them because they are a very key strategic client. Um, we have recently introduced the concept of account managers and project managers, so we have uh, account managers who check in on the health of, the emotional health of the client, the project progress, and have an escape valve to, you know, because like if you're the account manager, or if you're the project manager, and you're in, you're basically in the trenches, right? Sometimes if you have a conversation with the stakeholders or, or with, with the client's project manager, they may tell you something that you, they may not tell your project manager, it's just a different relationship. I think the other part of the question was, you know, you have your project managers who may not be so technical, and then do you have solutions architects or developers sit in meetings where sometimes they're completely non-relevant, right? But sometimes you really, really want that uh, technical resource on that, and um, I don't have a great answer for you on that. <laughs> I know this problem exists. Uh, I know that there's a need. Obviously, we need to solve that. Um, you know, on one hand, we don't want to waste people's times and our clients' money. Uh, uh, on, on one hand, uh, you know, sometimes it's really valuable and it really gets that, you know, where we talked about time to solution and time to resolution, especially on the support side, it really helps that. So we've seen a number of things. We have a 24-7 support team, so we have teams like kind of around the world and we, we notice that on certain client certain client interactions it, it does help to have that technical team on the, at least in the same time zone so that was really helpful uh, and we're trying to basically listen to our clients uh, and and when we sense like there's a technical person needed do it well we don't have like a hard rule that says you know every two weeks you have a half an hour the technical solution starts well, not yet not yet sure my pleasure any other questions yeah, sure. I love questions. So you said you do the, both, like new projects and support projects. And you have two different departments for that. So at some point, there is a break. So at some point, the, the project is launched. And when does it go actually to support? And like, uh, is, it, is it a matter of size? Can it go back to, big, to new project at a, different, at, a, at a certain size of a new of a new um, yeah project coming up, like or of, of a new development, how do how do you feel like that? You, as you said, it's it's about building a personal relationship. So do these person uh, relationships break? Do you ha do you build up new ones? Do you leave them the same? Many questions. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean these are really really good questions, right? These are very very important questions that we have asked ourselves and are still asking ourselves. You know, we try to have a hard definition around what goes to development and what goes to support. So we actually have very complementary skills in terms of the technical capability on our development team and our support team. 
we have great developers and solutions architects in development, and we have great developers and, and solutions architects in our support team. The approach is a little bit different, and we have really big, what you could consider continuous development projects in a support team. Um, the way we internally define it right now is when we have a project that has a start and an end date is in development. When we have a project that has you know, maybe a monthly budget or has a backlog of features and, and security updates and some other things, then we move them to support. That's how we differentiate it. So it's not, at first we thought it was just gonna be the size. But then we noticed that you know, our support team is really well equipped to have those ongoing meetings without an end date. And, and also we manage the security stuff and, and sometimes internal infrastructure and DevOps and we build that out for our clients and train them on their support and they have other developers internally and we have other team, you know, other dev shops that are working with them. And our support team is really kind of well, met, well trained and, and equipped to deal with that. Whereas our developers are just like, we're gonna hammer this away and we're gonna do a great job and we're gonna you know, crush this project and you know, th deliver on time on budget and it's gonna be great. So maybe that's kind of, that's one difference. And then the other question was, uh, how do we hand that off in, in a relationship? Th that's really key, like that, that's a really big concern because you know, like we, we, we talked about, we try to build great relationships. So sometimes the account managers help a little bit, so they, they help bridge that kind of loss of you know of a friend of a relationship. You know, don't, don't worry, it's going to be okay. I'll introduce you to your to to your new project manager. They're just as great as the other one. Um, so the account manager helps a, a little bit. Uh, we do have a process where we hand off, but but really we do have to break and we announce this and say, look, you know. This is going to, the project's going to be delivered here. There's a warranty period, and of course, we're going to be available for, for some questions, and we're going to do our best to do a transition knowledge transfer, but this is going over to support. Mm, hi, I am. I'm a developer, so um, I started like a new career in my company as a product manager, and you said earlier that um, there is this emotional connection and I think I'm having that problem. So how do you develop that emotional connection with the customer? I mean, it's, I think it's very interesting. Uh, well, I think emotional connection is most related to how much you want to do for your client. So yes, it has to do by putting yourself in your client's shoes and trying to think about how to make them happy. Um, but mostly it's based on communication. Um, because you know, um, the co when communications won't go wrong, then things escalate wrong very quickly. Like if you didn't um, tell him that his budget is almost gone, or you didn't tell him that um, maintenance is going to be at a certain hour and his side is going to be down or things like that when you don't, you don't, you don't, you know that, but um, sometimes you, you don't tell it at the right time, then it becomes a big deal. And that, that affects your relationship a lot. So first thing to work on, communication and really try to keep like a right outlook of, of life when you talk to them, <laughs> really. Yeah, so I, I, to me, most of the time it's really easy. Like I, I really, like I really love our clients, and I care about them, and I want them to succeed. I want, you know, I have to. I think about the fact that, you know, whether it's an owner who's paying you out of their own pocket and it's their money, right? So they're going to be really cared for, or whether it's somebody who li works in a multi-million-dollar company. Like, what do they want? Well, they want to raise. They want their projects to succeed. So you know, I really try to put them, myself in their shoes and, and see how, you know, how, and I think about it all the time and, I, and that's kind of the, how I interact with them. I talk to my clients all the time. I had a com an hour and a half conversation with a client of mine about some very personal things Saturday night while being totally late for dinner that I've planned for months in advance. Like I, I just, you know, we, in, we interact very openly and honestly and, and I feel that's my approach. I don't know whether that works for for everybody else, but I think it's it's really important, and and I think in the end it shows that you care. And also when you make mistakes, when we make mistakes, and we really work on it, like, you know, we dumped some 
AWS servers that were unrecoverable, and I got a call from a client. I said, look, I, I was on vacation. I'm like, here's the deal. I'm on vacation. The door's about to close. I'm with my family, crying baby. I'm going to land in two and a half hours, and I'm going to call you in two and a half hours. And sure enough, like we landed, I handed the baby over to my wife, and I'm like, what's going on? How can we help you? That helped. Like that was a really big investment for what I, it seemed to me not a big price, and they're, they're a lifer, I hope. <laughs> There's no guarantees in life, but I think so. Okay, I actually think I'm out of time. Gracias para invitarme. Gracias para tus preguntas. And hasta luego.